we shall begin. So this evening is looking at really the environmental influences on health and well-being through a nurse coaching lens. So the learning objectives for this evening very briefly are to explore the interconnectedness of our internal and external environments on health and well-being, to examine the environmental influences on health through an integrative nurse coaching model, and to explore environmental assessment as part of our nurse coaching process and to deepen self-awareness for behavioral change. And of course, identify the next steps in creating healthy environments in our own personal lives. So we'll be weaving our professional and personal experiences around the environment. And in the half hour that we have question and answers, I really would like to hear from you how you have used the environmental assessment tool and if it has come up in your coaching sessions. And if it hasn't, I would love to hear how you might be able to start to weave this and integrate this in. So the question really in coaching is how can we modify or change whatever it is in our daily lives that, are, that is interfering with our optimal health and well-being? Again, never to just parcel out one part of our coaching process, but we're focusing on the environmental piece this evening. And of course, we always defer to Florence Nightingale and our legacy of no amount of medical knowledge will lessen the accountability for nurses to, to do what nurses do, and that's to manage the environment to promote healthy life processes. So some of the concepts in integrative nurse coaching in environmental health is to look at these four meta paradigms that are part of our nursing legacy and focusing right now on the in internal and external environment in our surroundings and to put patients, clients, self in the best possible situation for natural laws of health to act upon them and to really go back to nature uh, as it was before our very modern industrial age. I want to explore some of things contribution in recent years, moving fast forward from Nightingale. And the American Nurses Association put forth a document and a call to action, encouraging nurses in, to understand the relationship between human health and environmental exposures and to integrate this knowledge into practice. This was updated in 2010. And the ANA standards uh, number 16 on environmental health looked at how we both promote environmental safety in the workplace and promote environmental health in our communities and to advocate for healthier environments and healthcare, including the products that are used. And we'll talk more about that toward the end of the uh, the conversation, and also to look at strategies to promote healthier communities, as many of us work in public health in communities. And so environmental health principles for public health nurses, again, all of these has links to the websites, is to look at how we could have sustained, safe environments as a, an essential condition within public health. And this, of course, with global warming, with all of the conditions we see today in the world, including right here in our own country of flooding and droughts and fires, to really look at what's our role as nurses in identifying potential environmental hazards in our communities. And always to look at the precautionary principle as a tenet for environmental health, which means how do we prevent environmental issues by being good stewards. And the rest will be, again, uh, as health advocates to understand the impact of the environment on all health and well-being. This was from the World Health Organization on an international conference looking at uh, prevention of cancer through environmental and occupational interventions and a call to action. And it was saying worldwide, cancer is the second leading cause of death. And to look at this puts 19% of all cancers 
uh, estimated to be attributable to the environment, including in our work settings. And so it's really important for us to look at how do we reduce exposures. The Institute of Medicine report specifically looked at nursing and health in the environment and to look at our role in a larger context of advocacy and education and looking at continuing education uh, that would allow for lobbying and media and the organizing. And this is all new for some of us in nursing. I think that nurse coaches are probably leading the way along with occupational nurses in how do we start to address the environmental issues that are impacting everything from children and asthma to the increase of breast cancer, which we're going to look at through a case study. And that this is becoming part of education. And this was an IOM report, interestingly, in 1995, talking about nurses leading the way. And as you can see, there's a book on nursing and health in the environment. So this is not new, but it's been slow to catch on. And I think our time has come, uh, unfortunately, due to global disasters combined with all of the public health issues that we're seeing. We talked in our uh, first module that uh, communicable diseases are no longer the primary cause of disease, but that uh, other factors are leading uh, in the, the causes and that environment is very much a contributable uh, cofactor in mostly all diseases. And the CDC came out in January 2010 and it's been updated since on chemicals found in the majority of people's urine and measured across populations, looking at everything from arsenic to bisphenol A to triclosan and perchlorates. And we'll review that. There was another big uh, policy paper that came out by Native American peoples, indigenous peoples in the US on the impact of climate change and environmental disasters in many of the regions where indigenous people uh, live on the land. And so there was a new strategic plan by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, a very important organization, looking at advancing science and improving health, a plan for environmental health research. And basically it said the big influences that have been understudied, all of which interact with traditional environmental exposures, including the microbiome, inflammation pathways, immunological pathways, nutrition, and epigenetic processes, all of which we're gonna to touch on tonight, but basically to say that this is now being recognized that environmental influences are impacting all aspects of human health and of all creatures. So it's important also to think about the financial cost of toxicity because $568 billion are spent yearly on environmentally caused illness. And even more striking is the environmental components that are involved in the chronic and degenerative diseases. And that's across the board from autoimmune to diabetes to heart disease. We can look at environmental cofactors in all. This is a one hour talk. So of course, we're uh, going to be very brief on some of this. And just a reminder that in our integrative nurse coach model, the environment, if you look at the bottom of the outer circle, is the internal and external healing environment and how environment is surrounding all aspects of our health and well being from cellular communication, immune function, hormonal balance, how it impacts our physical well being and, uh, and stress the stress of environmental exposures. So when we look at environmental influences on health, we're looking at in, in our home and in our community, we're looking at the economic impact of the environment and also how people in, in so, as a social determinant of health, many people live in environmentally vulnerable areas. 
We're thinking of how the environment impacts our genetics and our biochemistry, our emotions and our psychological well-being. Uh, a couple of the areas when we talk about the internal external environment, just as a review, we'll be looking at the microbiome, our genomics, the toxins within, uh, stress, inflammation, thoughts, nutrients, and organisms, all part of our internal environment. And we also look at how in our external environment, the air, the water, our, in our food sources, our communities, in our relationships, and home and personal care products. We talked a lot in module one about the food sources and that the majority of chemicals come from our foods, whether it be antibiotics in our animal products or pesticides and fertilizers and chemical preservatives in our food chain. And it's a very big part when we're doing the nutrition coaching aspect to also think about that. So understanding the origins of chronic disease, again, we're in the environmental component, looking at toxic chemical exposures, uh, Stress and negative emotions, poor diet, lack of exercise, drugs and alcohol, radiation and smoking, and how eventually all of this starts to close in on our body, decreasing our energy production, impairing our detoxification, impacting our GI uh, flora, microbiome, influencing hormones, uh, structural integrity on a cellular level. Uh, our immune system, and can certainly contribute to emotional stress. Uh, and you can just, again, look at all of this and how all of this starts to close in on a cellular level, creating what we'll call inflammation, which is the buzz today of all illnesses and pre-conditions uh, that we see. And eventually, all of that fit feeds into what we'll call chronic disease across the life cycle and across all health and illness. So we think of this in terms of functional toxicology, that we're exposed to toxicants. We all have a genetic predisposition. There are mediators that might trigger the effects of the environmental exposures. It could be stress-related. It could be poor diet. It could be trauma and how all of these eventually, again, it's another way of looking at a schematic of uh, how it impacts us. And more specifically, thinking about immune function, nervous system function, endocrine function, cardiovascular function, cancers, GI, and that as we're doing our coaching, and pe people are coming to us, or we're working in communities or hospitals where there's a specific uh, targeted audience to think about that. As many of you know, I work with early onset Alzheimer's and the environmental component when we do testing and when we take a history and, and do a timeline, we're looking at what exposures did you have? Was it that you had all your mercury fillings uh, removed? Was it that you got exposed to pesticides, spraying your lawn and the wind blowing back in the wrong direction? There's so many mediators and triggers that we're trying to identify to understand why people are having uh, symptoms. So we know that, that there's 85,000 chemicals, 216 of them have been identified with mammary gland tumors. And this is across the spectrum of the chemicals in our current environment, from industrial to pesticides, dyes, in our drinking water and pharmaceuticals in the drinking water and hormones. So the total toxic load that we're exposed to combined with our ability to detoxify and excrete toxins leads to our total toxic load. The good news is we're gonna look at studies that show that just eating an organic diet and increasing fruits and vegetables can bring levels down of many of the chemicals that we've been exposed to. So the body is amazingly resilient. And so that's the good news as I present this uh, scary, 
other side of living in the modern world. And just, you know, whether it's pollution and looking at studies of children in China or looking at uh, contaminated drinking water, uh, the Environmental Working Group, EWG.org, and I have that reference at the end, has now a listing of the water in most major cities and what is in the major systems and water supplies and the runoff. So when we look at environmental exposures, we're looking at everything from lead in children. We know about Flint, Michigan in the water supply. We're looking at the air quality issues and the increase in respiratory illnesses that we see with increased industrialization uh, and the water contamination, the excess pesticide exposure, the products we're putting on our skin, and our exposure to many heavy metals, such as mercury and arsenic. And we also look at the electromagnetic fields. We don't talk enough about that, but we know that EMFs have a major uh, influence on our body's self-signaling and how there's a lot of influence uh, when we're exposed too often. So the toxic in pathways, water, air, food, soil, dust, sediment, again, personal care products. And what we're looking at is not only the exposure, but our ability to excrete and eliminate the toxins we take in. We've seen this before. Our genes haven't changed, but our environment has, whether it be the fast foods that we're eating or the other chemical exposures. And we've already talked about the emerging field of epigenetics, that our genes haven't changed, and also that our genes are not our destiny, that we have the capacity to be able to influence how our genes express themselves. So we have our genes, we have the environment, and we have us, the phenotype. And each of us is unique and individual. And that's what we're always exploring in our coaching model of, yes, your mother had breast cancer or your father had heart disease. What is it in your environment that may fuel your genetic predisposition? And the good news in our positivist psychology is what can we do about that? So in the field of toxicogenomics, and I'm planting a lot of these terms because they're becoming popular in the literature. And as nurses, we want to be cutting edge and know what is out there in the field. We're looking at the individual variations in what we'll call detoxification. And that's how our body handles the, uh, the chemicals we take in, the chemicals in the food chain, in the air, what we put on our skin. And we all have different genetic makeup. Uh, we call them SNPs, singular nucleotide polymorphisms. We can get tested for them. And that tells us a lot about how our detoxification pathways handle uh, different exposures. Just as an example, in working with the Alzheimer's patients, we look at a very specific gene called HLA-4. And that tells us how people detoxify mold if they've been exposed to mold. Because in these times of floods and hurricanes and disasters, people are exposed to a lot of mold. And why do some people get sick and terribly affected and others don't? And a lot of it has to do with these genetic variations. And Lifestyle factors can mediate a lot of that, as well as you know the, the, the exposures themselves. And so the risk is based on individual genotypes, especially as it relates to detoxification. At the end, if we have time, I will share that with you. So again, modern, modern chronic diseases have a nutritional component, a lifestyle component, a genetic component, and an environmental component, and then that alters our genetic expression. How the environment impacts our health is, again, looking at communities and risk factors, whether it be farm workers exposed to pesticides, children in urban environments, uh, and other, other risk factors like noise and uh, the clim climate change. This is a, a 
diagram from the World Health Organization, and it's available on their website. And what we're calling the exposome, which is our external exposures, how that impacts our internal exposures um, and how that impacts our functional part of who we are and what the health outcomes might be. And you could see here, it's everything from consumer products, physical activity is a great mediator, uh, clean water, healthy diet, green social impact, uh, traffic. Uh, we're looking at how you know communities are building uh, urban environments where you can walk and not have to take cars to cut down the carbon footprint. And these are just different ways of positioning when we're working in community, how we begin to think about this. And I just want to share that living in Florida, there's a tremendous exposure to biotoxins that we're concerned and, and, and confronted with, whether it be hurricanes and mold in our uh, structures, we have red tide, which we attribute to the runoff into the ocean of agricultural byproducts like uh, fertilizers that are changing the pH of the water and allowing these algae to grow. And this is a really big environmental issue down here because people that live near the water along the coast are having respiratory problems because there's a very big um, component that the algae are also airborne. And so people with respiratory problems are actually advised to stay indoors. We're looking at the fish and the exposures of the fish to a lot of the runoff. And on the left is a Zika mosquito, because as a result of the Zika virus, we're being sprayed overhead and in communities with heavy duty pesticides. And there's a lot of questioning and community outrage about this because there's other ways than just also killing off you know the bees and the butterflies and the insects that help to protect the land so this is just something we're dealing here in florida when people are coming in with a lot of different symptoms uh, and we're trying to hone in on what the environmental uh, components are. And so we're really looking at how do we become an environmental detective? This is really a big piece of our nurse coaching. You know, we're always curious and we're always asking questions. And so when we do an environmental assessment, we're looking at the home, the workplace, our community, all of the lifestyle factors, our cleaning products, our personal care products. And we use the Iowa tool a lot. What I'd like to do is just look at a case study and we'll be coming back to this theme. This is a nurse who's 32 years old who works the night shift on a med surge unit. She was working for the past year on this new job. And until a year ago, she was, quote, healthy. And the new job was stressful and it was high pressure. Uh, she, her intention was to begin a family and she was trying to get pregnant and couldn't. She also had a recent 10 pound weight gain and she came for coaching around the weight. She also had increased fatigue. Uh, she had a recent mammography that showed a suspicious vascular change and she was going to get it followed up with a biopsy because there was a suspicion that there was something there. She'd recently developed allergies in, in getting her story uh, and using the environmental tool. She recently had a history of allergies and respiratory problems and she noted noticed that it got worse on the night shift. And that's when they cleaned with a very strong disinfectant. She also, in asking to tell more about her story and her exposures, at the time they were still using triclosan uh, in the hospital and she washed her hands, she figured more than 50 times, well, a night, in her, for her it was a day, but a night, 
uh, in between patient rooms. And she also, her eating patterns had changed, working the night shifts. She didn't really know how to get back on track. Uh, at the end of the night, she was hungry. She ate fast food and take, and you know, had a lot of takeout, which she also brought to work. So in the nurse coach process, of course, we listened to Jenny's story. We established a relationship and identified her readiness to change. We identified opportunities, issues, and concerns that she had. And in creating the structure and coaching interaction, uh, Jenny established some client-centered goals. We started with the Iowa tool, which we always do, which was looking at the whole person. So we looked at her stress, her sleep patterns, her activity levels. We identified her environmental exposures, which she was beginning to suspect. And so that was, of course, where she wanted to zero in. We also did something called a symptom questionnaire or an MSQ, which is a medical symptom questionnaire. This comes from the Institute of functional medicine. And it's basically a toxicity self-test. And it's a wonderful tool and we'll share it in module two. We also worked on a timeline and we'll talk about that in a moment, as well as her keeping a diet and lifestyle, a food journal and looking at diet and lifestyle. So this is a timeline. And what's interesting about the timeline is we wanna know what happened before the symptoms? What were the antecedents? What were the mediators? When did something occur that might have influenced Jenny's symptoms? And what were the triggering events? So we might say the antecedents were that uh, Jenny started uh, a new job and that her lifestyle changed in terms of her hours and her, uh, her basically her, her structure of, in her life. The mediators were uh, that she changed other lifestyle habits that impacted her sleep, her stress, she stopped exercising. And the trigger event was more the actual environmental exposures of when her symptoms began. We also looked at organizing her uh, her lifestyle tendencies by her telling her story and retelling it. So on the left, you see the antecedents, triggering events, and contributors that we could write in and use this as a chart. And it's a wonderful tool that we'll go over uh, and have for you in module two. We looked at all aspects that of her lifestyle that are all modifiable personal factors. Again, sleep, environment, nutrition, stress, relationships. And using this to look at how did it impact her digestion, her nutrition, her immune function, her mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being her ability to transform and eliminate, how it might have affected her hormonal balance when she talked about not getting pregnant, and all aspects of her that she felt were relevant and wanted to make some changes on. So we wanted to work on identifying the toxic sources in her workplace and in her home environment. And again, this is a list of some chemicals that could be in both. Uh, from uh, ke the chemicals in the cleaning products at home and in the workplace, and some things that were very specific. And again, you can study this as we uh, go through some of the more specific chemicals. One of the things we're always looking at is heavy metals. We mentioned lead pipes and in the drinking water. Mercury could be in everything from eating too much farm-raised uh, fish to uh, mercury in fatty fish like tuna and uh, swordfish, for example, that mercury tends to get stored. It's in the water, it's part of runoff, and it gets stored in fat tissue, including in human fat tissue. Arsenic. Arsenic is being found more and more because arsenic is part of feed 
with chickens and especially rice. When we see high arsenic levels in people, we're always exploring in their foods what they're eating because a lot of arsenic comes from that. It also comes from treated wood. So children playing in playgrounds uh, that work with arsenic treated wood sometimes will show high arsenic levels. And a lot of these tests can be done in commercial labs. Cadmium is usually identified with cigarettes and cigarette smoke, even secondhand smoke. And when we look at heavy metal toxicity, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere, but we have wonderful ability to detoxify and excrete. We have natural chelators that can break down heavy metals, including proteins and some antioxidants that are in a healthy body like glutathione and vitamin C. But if we cannot break down the heavy metals, it can lead to a higher risk, again, based on genetics for cardiovascular disease, renal disease, and cancer. So I'm gonna segue to breast cancer as a prototype. And I just wanna say that pink ribbons have brought an awareness to breast cancer, but it has not really literally exposed what is going on with the increase in breast cancer and in younger and younger women. So I just want to go through some of the environmental components of that. There was a study that was put out by an organization called Health and the Environment Alliance out of Europe, and it's part of a large body of NGOs looking at breast cancer, that it's not simply lifestyle or genetic, but the result of environmental factors, notably the exposure to chemicals. And this has been built upon over the years by many other organizations. Harvard School of Public Health came out on, with a uh, white paper on combating environmental causes of cancer. And what was said was that we need a new national cancer prevention strategy emphasizing primary prevention that redirects both research and policy agendas to set tangible goals for reducing and eliminating environmental exposures implicated in cancer causing uh, causation. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And again, the dates are older, but the point of having these going back to 2009, 10, and 11 is that this information has been around for more than a decade. And yet, there has not been any cancer policy that has addressed uh, the environmental cofactors. And, you know, oncology and research is really slow. There's more emphasis on new drugs to target than there is for prevention. And again, I have to go back to who we are as nurses and who we are as nurse coaches. The state of the evidence, which comes out every year, has looked at the connection between breast cancer and the environment, and it continues to update their data. And they say that singly and in combination, toxicants contribute significantly to the increasing rates of breast cancer observed over the last several decades. This was from a journal on environmental health data 2017. So when we look at environmental exposures, we're looking at a couple of things. We're concerned about the dose of the exposure, how much, the timing, because there are critical windows of development, like prenatally, in early childhood, uh, pre-pregnancy, and in older years, when the metabolic pathways and detoxification pathways slow down. So some of you may know this study on critical windows of development. It was a benchmark investigation on industrial chemicals done on umbilical cord blood by the American Red Cross and the Environmental Working Group. And what they found was more than 278 chemicals in the umbilical cord blood, which means that the moms and dads from the sperm and ovary eggs uh, influenced the uh, capacity for the child's uh, exposures and at birth. So part of the issue really is that chemicals act synergistically. You may have one chemical that the chemical industry says 
proof it causes cancer in small amounts. Although that may be true, what happens when you're exposed to your favorite personal care product that you put on your skin every day that has parabens and phthalates and dyes? And what happens when you have several exposures and then your body is just overwhelmed with its uh, capacity to detoxify and excrete the toxins? So this is an important report that was from 2018 that said a mixture of common chemicals perturbs benign human breast epithelial cells uh, and much more than chemicals individually. So the chemicals known as estrogenic chemicals, xenoestrogens, endocrine disruptors, are a potential risk factor for breast cancer carcinogenesis. And that they are so ubiquitous in the environment, and we're looking at everything from plastic bottles to um, flame retardants that are put on mattresses and clothing, that we're looking at how all of that has a cumulative effect. And the Endocrine Society, which is actually a very conservative medical organization, came out in 2015 and said, as, um, environmental endocrine disruptors alter the gene environment interactions via physiological, cellular, molecular, and epigenetic changes, thereby producing effects in exposed individuals as well as their descendants. And why that's really important is there have been studies that show that even three generations out, moms that have been exposed to bisphenol A, the offspring three generations later still have a high level, all which can contribute to uh, onset many problems, including breast cancer. So that there's definitely an epidemiological and uh, component. So let's look at what these endocrine disruptors are very briefly. Think of all the Ps, pesticides, whether it be organophosphates or atrazine, pollutants like dioxin, petrochemical fuels and solvents, plasticizers like phthalates and bisphenol A, pigments like paints, dyes, red dye number you know, one, yellow dye number three in children's cereal make them pretty, or in gummy bears, preservatives and flame retardants and pharmaceuticals. All of these have the capacity to be what's called estrogen disruptors. And what that really means is that they look like molecularly estrogen. So they're taken up at estrogen receptor sites, whether it be the breast, the ovaries, the uterus, or the testes in male. And you may see many men with bigger breasts as they get older, and I see them and I think, hmm, I wonder what they've been exposed to, that they're also having some mammary gland development. So here's what's it, bisphenol A, which is the big one that we hear the most about, and there's been the most research, are in canned foods, and these are just some of the canned foods, including coconut milk. We hear about coconut milk being healthy. If people buy things in cans, they should transfer them to bottles. The reason that uh, bisphenol A as a plastic is lining the cans is for protection from the aluminum, which in itself is very unhealthy, from getting rusted, from oxidizing, and then having damage to the foods. But it's a good rule of thumb. If people are gonna buy packaged foods, uh, frozen is better than canned. And even the things that say bisphenol A free has another kind of uh, resin liner that we are waiting to hear what that is about. So some of the other endocrine disruptors, very important in pesticides. Lindane is something that's used on lice in children when they put the, it on their scalps. Atrazine is the most heavily used um, herbicide in the world. And there's been some major studies looking at atrazine as feminizing creatures in nature. Specifically, the work was done on frogs by, a, um, by someone named Tyrone Hayes, who has really literally exposed atrazine. He was hired by the company Syngenta to prove that it was safe. And he actually found out 
that the frog, the male frogs were developing female eggs. And he went to the company and told them and they asked, they tried to silence him. And if you go on the internet, he's been widely discredited. And he was, they took away his lab at the University of Berkeley um, because of funding reasons. And this is a very big issue because we're not being given the whole story. And flame retardants are another one. Heavy metals are also an estrogen disruptor. And again, I mentioned the plasticizers, you know, our favorite nail polish that has phthalates. All of that it has potential to impact us. So the question really is, how do we, with our, with our, in our nurse coaching, in our, as educators, as advocates, how do we have people start to cut back and really start to keep a journal on what they think they might be using? Toward the end, I have many websites where you can really look at this and see what you might want to change out for a healthier product. Um, this is just to look at how in utero exposures like bisphenol A is, is attributed to female reproductive disorders, endometrial hyperplasia, and breast cancer. And looking at how it alters our ability to methylate, which is part of the detoxification pathway and part of our genetic, our ability to modulate uh, epigenetic expression. And so the gene environment interaction is often driven early in life to exposures and to increased risks of estrogens and potentially uh, breast cancer. So early puberty has also shown a, a rise, it, not only in breast cancer earlier, but in polycystic ovary syndrome, um, depression, anxiety, and high-risk behaviors, which is a whole other subject, but really when uh, a girl enters puberty and has breasts at age nine and is not really emotionally equipped to deal with it, there is a lot of psychological um, anxiety uh, issues around that. The Falling Age of Puberty was an incredible report by Sandra Steingraber. She runs some, an organization called Silent Spring and uh, has done some incredible work. She herself, and you can look at a lot of her work through the breastcancerfund.org. And she herself is a breast cancer survivor of a young woman lived in an area that had a lot of um, pesticide spraying. And she wrote a book, The Downstream Effects of the, um, the Exposures from the Water Contamination. So just uh, as a way to look at this, the red are the causes for estrogen dominance and the prevention are the green circles or ovals, organic foods, improving diet and exercise, reducing stress, uh, progesterone and bioidentical hormones are listed here. Usually they're compounded and they're from a more natural source. And uh, looking at how to lower the progesterone estrogen ratios, this is something that uh, a more functional medicine gynecologist would work on. And also looking at things like insulin resistance. We're not really talking much about this, but insulin and uh, and endocrine disruptors are very much connected, as is obesity that I'll show you in a moment. So here's another way to look at this, the complexity of breast cancer prevention. We're looking at the purple, which is food additives, pesticides, DDT, sunscreens, phthalates, bisphenol A, parabens, et cetera, et cetera. And you can look at all of this and then combining it with childhood and adolescent exposures and other genetic polymorphisms such as the BRCA gene. Uh, question is one could have the BRCA gene, maybe one's grandmother had the BRCA gene but grew up on a, you know, living on the land and never had breast cancer and suddenly the younger generations who uh, lived a different industrial urban lifestyle develop breast cancer. So is it that it's in your genes or is it that the triggers were exposures to that increasing that risk? 
course, we know uh, no children, late first birth, uh, alcohol, uh, late menopause, early puberty, all of those are also contributors. Some of that may be from exposure to estrogens creating early puberty and late menopause. Endocrine disruptor symptoms, when we're doing our history and our intake and listening to the story, could have many factors from uh, obesity to sleep disorders. And uh, one of the things that has been found is that when adipose tissue, fatty tissue is analyzed, uh, it shows that many chemicals are in the breast tissue from uh, perhaps a long time ago because the accumulation of DDT, DDT was banned in the 50s, but if the moms were exposed, it got passed on to the children, just as we know about DES, which for those of you that may remember, DDS was a drug that was given, a hormone for women to hold their pregnancy if there was a risk of miscarriage. And the offspring of those moms who took DES had to have a much higher rate. And now we're into the second and third generation of ovarian and uterine cancer. So that we know that it just doesn't go away after the, the exposure to one generation. And we're also looking at how in endocrine disruptors get stored in fat tissue and can affect uh, all hormonal systems, but also affect cell signaling. So that fat, it's hard to, for fat to break down. The person that comes for a weight loss uh, coaching session because they just can't lose weight, they're eating, they're exercising. As a, a nurse coach and as a nurse expert, to think about, I wonder if maybe there's an environmental component that might also be contributing to not being able to have fat cells communicate and break down. The other thing I'll say is that when people do lose a lot of weight, a lot of times there's chemicals that break down with the fat tissue. And it's very important that detoxification pathways are functional. People are moving their bowels. They're, you know, uh, making sure they sweat through their skin, maybe using a dry loofah. This is, you know, part of a detoxification program so that people and, and eat a lot of clean organic vegetables that will help the detoxification pathways to function optimally. So there's a lot of obesity research now, and these are called obesogens. And the hypothesis is, is that the chemical pollutants promote obesity, obesity by altering the homeostatic metabolic set points, disrupting appetite control, and uh, perturbing lipid homeostasis to promote adipocyte hypertrophy or stimulating ad ad adipogenic pathways that enhance uh, this during uh, adulthood. And it's thought to act like they're hijacking the regulatory system that controls body weight. And there were some professors that uh, really looked at biopsies and fat and talked about why endocrine disruptors are making us fat and why um, diets don't always work. And I always think of it when you look at children and the obesity epidemic, including in China today, that China has an obesity epidemic in children under six years of age. And you wonder what are the chemicals that these children are exposed to, as well as the fast food and the changes in their traditional cultural ways. So this is a really interesting piece to add to our knowledge base of how uh, the chemicals that help us to feel satiated as well as break down fats are being uh, hijacked, as they say. And so it's especially relevant because the adipose tissue uh, and the adipocytes are the most affected. And that adiponectin it certainly plays a role in glucose metabolism as well. So it plays a role in glucose metabolism. Fatty acid oxidation are good essential fatty acids. Obesity, atherosclerosis, and it's a major player. So in preventing metabolic syndrome, again, we're always talking about diet and exercise and getting your insulin 
levels down, your fasting insulin and your hemoglobin A1C. What about the exposure of the chemicals at the same time? How do we look more deeply into that in our environment? Uh, so here's the good news. What happens when you try to get bisphenol A out of your diet? Okay, it's, you know, enough doom and gloom. So the Breast Cancer Fund and the Silent Spring Institute enlisted five families to participate in a study of bisphenol A and phthalate exposure from food packaging because they wanted to find out people that eat packaged foods have much higher levels of these as preservatives, as chemicals, as plastic in the packaging. So for three days, the families were provided fresh food, not canned or packed in plastic packaged in plastic. They avoided all of that. They uh, did not eat any meals outside the home. And the effect was significant. While families were eating what they call our food, the healthy food, the BPA levels dropped an average of 60%. That's the good news. And that's really important when we're looking at prevention, being proactive, losing weight, reversing cardiometabolic syndrome, uh, hormonal dysfunction. So the takeaway is to reduce BPA by using fresh foods, avoiding canned foods, choosing glass and stainless steel, especially if microwaving, and never to use plastic. And I think we all know that. So in our modern food supply, just as a review, because these are the endocrine disruptors and we talk about it in the food and why do we always talk organic, looking at the environmental working group, the, the, uh, the clean 15, the dirty dozen, the foods that, and that fruits and vegetables most sprayed, because we're looking at DDT, atrazine, organochlorines and 800 potential other pesticides and herbicides. We all know this. Uh, and here goes back to what I was talking about earlier of why male fish are becoming female and researchers worry about the pollutants in our water supply. And looking, this is the frogs who became feminized and had uh, high levels of uh, endocrine disruptors in their system, pesticides and uh, female eggs in the male instead of sperm. So when we look at contaminated water, I think this is an important study to touch on because when men get breast cancer, they, uh, the medical research community pays attention. This was a study done at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, and it was published in 2016. And what they looked at was chemical solvents in drinking water at a Marine Corps base camp in uh, during 19, I forget all of the years, but I think it was the 60s through 1985. And the case controlled study evaluated the association between exposure of the, and, it, and drinking the contaminated water and male breast cancer risk. And the findings suggested possible associations. It was actually an epidemic of breast cancer over a 20 year period, it took 20 years. So this was a slow developing process, just as if children or prenatally are exposed, it may not manifest until uh, other triggers and mediating factors come into play. But I think this is very telling. And what was in the water, it was a cumulative exposure to all kinds of solvents. And what it really was, was the fuel tanks underground were leaching into the drinking water. Just as people that live near airports. I had a patient recently from uh, Jamaica, no, I'm sorry, Nassau, who lived near the airport and said that the fuel tanks were underground within a half a mile of their well water. And when they had it tested, these were the things that they found, benzene and byproducts. And this is a person who had early onset Alzheimer's, got water filters, actually decided to move because realized that some of what was going on was probably the result of environmental exposures. And so we all know about Roundup, Monsanto, it's the biggest uh, pesticide, herbicide, globally. 
and the resistance even with a lot of uh, suits right now, people being sued for uh, class action suits, having them FOMA, non Hodgkins, and they're getting millions of dollars, but the weed killer continues on, the lobbyists continue to have it um, available to the public and deny that the, the product actually was part of the cause. DDT, again, I mentioned that uh, it may be banned here, it's exported overseas, and it's still in products today. Animals still carry it on, in their offspring, and people that were tested by the CDC still had DDT. And again, male infertility, miscarriages, girls exposed before puberty, much greater risk of breast cancer. For those of us older enough, we may remember the trucks and we may remember even running behind them in, with the fumes because it was like a fun thing to do as a kid. Uh, but this is also real and can also cause nervous system and liver damage. So this was a Time Magazine, 1947. DDT is good for me. I mean, these were the jingles at that time. Uh, so the glyphosate-based herbicides are what uh, the Monsanto product is. And looking at how, they, again, they disrupt endocrine signaling systems, including pathways. And the timing of exposure severity will impact the levels and the tissue and the, the damage based on many different um, mechanisms. Now, I think I put this in because I thought it was really interesting that celiac and gluten intolerance is now being attributed to glyphosate, which is uh, Roundup. And looking at the residue on wheat and other crops, because after they're picked, an extra serving of glyphosate is put in on it so that they the wheat won't mold while it's waiting for harvest. And it's become a growing process. And of course, Roundup is the, um, the causal factor. And so we also know that fish exposed to glyphosate because glyphosate also goes into the water stream, also develop digestive problems reminiscent of celiac disease. And it also creates an imbalance in gut bacteria because the gut bacteria cannot handle the glyphosate. So we also wind up with dysbiosis. So the question really is IBS, Crohn's disease, um, you know, constipation, the microbiota, the, the microbiome being disrupted. How much of that is from the chemicals that we're being exposed to. So again, how do people go back to the land? How do they choose foods that are not as heavily sprayed? And this was a study on the uh, exposure to organophosphates. The other one was on bisphenol A, but again, good news that organic diets significantly lower children's exposure to the organophosphorus pesticides. And this was done by the Department of Environmental Health School of Public Health at Emory a couple of years ago. And it also showed that by changing the diet, by eating more organic food and less exposure to pesticides, you can reverse a lot of the symptoms that children have because they also cause nervous system exposures and learning disabilities. So I want to segue into so what is our environmental legacy? So now we have this information. Nursing has been involved in this for a long time. And what's the incidence of disease as related to all of our chemical exposures? And I'm gonna just pose this question for you for a second as I walk away. How does your workplace environment support your health and well-being, and that of your patients? So this, I'm going to leave you with this because I think this is really important as we move forward and think about our own health and well-being, going back to our self-care model, and how do we also impact this, the environments within the hospital setting. I'm going to go through something in about three minutes because I want to open it up for at least 20 minutes of questions. 
There's a lot of movement today looking at creating healthy workplace environments. Goes back, this was International Nurses Day, May 2007, positive practice environments. Occupational safety and health is looking at over 18 million healthcare workers, the second largest growing sector, and how do we take care of ourselves and our healthcare community? Because nurses face chronic exposures to the complex mixtures of chemicals. We know that we're exposed, this was the ANA did this, along with the Environmental Working Group, Healthcare Without Harm, and the University of Maryland School of Nursing, looking at triclosan as an antibacterial, latex gloves, radiation, medications, mercury. Those of us that remember mercury thermometers, they are being phased out globally. Cleaning products, and they list hospital food as another environmental hazard. Uh, so exposures are real. Uh, and uh, there was an online survey of 1,500 nurses that was conducted by this study, and the information was provided. Uh, the exposure showed an increased risk of asthma, miscarriage, cancer, and actually birth defects in the offspring. This is the actual study of an increase in cancer and miscarriages very specifically. And so the conclusion of one of the areas was looking at triclosan, which many of us used over time, and the, how triclosan spurred the growth of breast cancer. So it's been phased out in most hospitals. It's very important to make sure that you're using Purell, which is alcohol-based. And the reason it was phased out is because the FDA, even the EPA, came out with... Uh, policy statement said it was a, it was a hazard, hazardous to uh, healthcare workers and specifically nurses. Uh, so it had the potential to alter gut flora, disrupt thyroid and endocrine function, disrupt reproduction, reproductive function, and affect body weight, according to a, uh, N. Haynes' report on nurses. It also had, a, nurses who used it had a higher risk of liver damage, and increased cancer risk. And again, it showed uh, all of these uh, potential issues. So healthcare, Healthier Hospitals Initiative, hhi.org, has been leading hospitals for a healthier future. And uh, not only with chemicals, but energy, less waste, uh, smarter purchasing, and a lot of this comes from nurses. There's a growing network of nurses in the U.S. and globally who understand the environment and our health. And I really would love for nurse coaches and holistic nurses uh, to really be more involved. We talk about holistic nursing, and yet the environmental co component is often uh, not in not as prominent as it really needs to be. Environ.org is a nursing organization. HNE known as Annie is another one. And Healthcare Without Harm, HCWH, leading a global movement for environmentally responsible healthcare, started by nurses and working with labor unions and environmental organizations. So in nursing leadership, I mean to think that we are a body of 3.4 million in the US and 19 globally, the impact that we could have. And so I think we're more than a small group, but I always love Margaret Mead quote, I've never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that has. And so implementing solutions, we are nurse coaches, but we're also educators and advocates. And we want to promote healthier communities wherever we are. Community gardens are springing up on rooftops in hospitals. They're uh, beginning to uh, be in schools and children are learning about real food early on. So in terms of advocacy and health policy, nurses have gotten engaged in legislative actions. I think some of you know, I believe there's four nurses, women who are now 
uh, in the House of Representatives. Yay. I mean, having nurses there, we need to lobby and write them and be part of nursing leadership and stewardship. And just want to say that it was nurses in the Northwest who, because of antibiotic resistant infections and MRSA in the healthcare system, causing $20 billion a year, where 80% of the antibiotics we use is an animal feed, they fueled taking food out of hospitals that were filled with antibiotics. That's major in terms of purchasing power and supporting ranchers and farmers who don't use antibiotics in their feed. And this is just an idea of what's in uh, farm-raised animals, antibiotics, hormones, pesticides, and genetically modified feed. So getting back to Jenny, and I'll leave this with you. We talked about her allergies and respiratory problems with chemicals. We talked about her washing her hands 50 times a day and how she was eating fast food. So if you had this as her story, after this presentation, think about what might be some interventions, some coaching uh, ways that we could guide Jenny toward considering how her lifestyle, her work environment might be impacting her. She could go to HR and purchasing and try to get healthier chemicals, healthier chemicals, that's kind of an oxymoron, but healthier products for cleaning in, her, in the workplace, certainly in her home environment where she has more control, changing her nutrition, increasing her exercise, and eliminating products that could be uh, forms of envi in, in estrogen environmental um, it disruptors. So in her coaching process, after establishing a relationship and identifying the opportunities, we created a structure where she reached her goals and what were her goals to follow in this direction. She wanted to minimize her exposures, uh, increase her, her bowel patterns because working nights they were off. We talked about her antioxidant reserve in terms of real food, optimizing her mitochondrial function, which is energy support within the cell, and helping her body to biotransform the toxicants through an array of uh, healthy fruits and vegetables. This chart is really important. Where the green arrow leads is to all of the cruciferous vegetables that basically impact every part of your phase one and phase two detoxification pathways. It's another conversation to talk about detoxification, but just to say the more watercress, broccoli, cauliflower, etc that one eats, the more they will enhance their detoxification. So in tandem with elimination of the chemicals, increasing as much as possible the organic produce in this particular last column. And so can fruits and vegetables be the new drug? That is really as uh, working with people with nutrition and the environment, this is really a key component. So I want to go back to, for us as nurses, just our own affirmations of how we could have a healthy non-toxic home environment and uh, a non-toxic work environment and do some reflective process on how do we make healthier choices. Many of you do, but maybe your colleagues or your family members uh, ha are having issues and they're not. And certainly in your coaching uh, conversations and in the coaching practices that you're working on now. These are just, again, it'll be on the dashboard. Some of the, uh, the website, safecosmetics.org, lets you see uh, all of the products that you love and are using, the shampoos and looking at the parabens and the uh, formaldehydes and dyes and what the healthier ones are. Here's some other healthcare without harm, healthier hospitals, green hospitals, Earth Rose Institute, which is 
an organization I founded about 15 years ago on women and children's health in the environment. Uh, and these are all of the organizations that we want to support. So I'll leave you with how do we work to create change? Imagine if the 3.4 million nurses in the United States worked to create healthier community and hospital healing environments, how we can make a difference in the health of everyone.